Just Business with Steve Thomas and John Wool. And now, here's your host, Chris Leary. Hello and welcome to It's Just Business on the Hogstein Network, a show where we look at the dollars and the nonsense of the sports media industrial con. What, the, what is it called? Complex, that's right. Um, <laughs> Are you forgetting the intro to the show? I, know, I oh, forgot no. the intro. Uh, <laughs> it's an early day. Word. We're recording early in the morning this time. That's right. It's Saturday. <laughs> um, but yes, Steve, how are you doing in this post-Super Bowl, post-Sunday uh, football universe? Oh, I'm doing okay. Um, you know, I'm glad it was a it was an interesting Super Bowl. I'm just what you know. I don't know if you had any like favorite commercials and all that stuff. I've become more and more disinterested in the commercials. You know, I've I've never been one to hang on all those commercials, but this year it's like I just paid no attention to them whatsoever. Like there was nothing that truly caught my eye as, wow, this is a truly creative commercial that I would rather spend my time watching this than getting another bowl of chips. Uh, I concur with that general philosophy. Uh, I never got super excited. I mean, the fact that they get you excited to watch an ad is a is a pretty nefarious victory right there. Um, to the ones that I didn't, I wasn't impressed with what I did see, and the only reason I would see them is because I was not in the process of getting up and doing something else, and was just waiting for the game to get back. But so the ones I paid attention to, I thought were all pretty pretty bad to begin with and I I I have not been hoodwinked by the excitement over commercials. Oh, no, I just haven't either. And I mean I I don't know. I mean, I I guess it's you know, they they've played it up in an interesting fashion and they've made it a thing. They made it a Super Bowl thing. There's no time in the calendar at all other than Super Bowl weekend when anybody is going to say a word about any of these ads. You know? <laughs> And I don't know how it became a thing, but all of a sudden it has. So congratulations to the New York ad firms. <laughs> yeah, right. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> you created a thing for your thing when nobody cares about your thing at all any other time of the year. Yeah, as a boondoggle, it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But but other than that, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we had uh, the death of Kobe Bryant <laughs> Two weeks ago, since we did our, since we recorded our last show, that happened, and that was a, certainly a very sad thing. Um, you know, still kind of hard to believe. You know, to be honest. You know, yeah, it no, took me, it, it took you know, somebody, a family member, texted me that while I was in the grocery store, and uh, I just like stood there staring at my phone for like ten minutes, going, "Nah, this isn't right. This is some like somebody's." awful sick joke you know it was really took a while to even accept that something like that could happen to a guy like that it was one of you know there's just sometimes those transcendent deaths that sort of have that that effect i definitely had a similar you know i've got that incessant alerts on my phone um and i just sort of peeked down i was like what you know like similar kind of that can't be real type of well, reaction. Yeah, I mean, and as you know, I'm a Laker fan, and so, you know, I got a whole bunch of messages from a whole bunch of people, you know, about it. You know, I just, yeah, you know, I still feel sorry for him. And, and I think what was, you know, really telling is the reaction of the city of Los Angeles. If you, I mean, neither of us live in Southern California <laughs> right now, but, um, I mean, it wasn't just about basketball with this guy. You know, he really, he and his wife really did a lot for the community. Um, you know, they've put a lot of time and energy in helping the homeless and, you know, a bunch of things like that. And I think that was a part of the visceral reaction that, in particular, Los Angeles had was because he was so involved in so many other things. Which is easy to do when you have time and money, <laughs> you know, by For the sure. way. I mean, yeah. Um, and it's a, you know, also just the, the circumstances. Obviously his daughter, obviously other people, a helicopter crash is sort of horrific in its own way you know um then how is i don't that, that, i gotta think of the right word here is a little bit newsworthy in and of itself you know it's not it's not celebrities don't often die maybe small planes but you know helicopter crashes are not something we hear about on the regular so the whole thing was just had a surreal quality i, I mean speaking as a pilot here i'm not a professional pilot but i am a licensed pilot i, I couldn't figure out why this helicopter didn't just 
file an instrument flight plan. You know, it's probably because he's too lazy and it was only a, you know, 40 mile journey. But if the weather's questionable like that, why are you messing around with, you know, visual flight rules? I just don't understand. I mean, that was that he could have filed an instrument flight plan, you know, gone up to an, you know, a proper altitude, not having to worry about any of it. It would have been more of a hassle. It probably would have taken more time, uh, you know, to, to do that. But I, clearly it should have been done, you know, yeah, as, as is evident by the result. So I'd never understood. That. I'll be anxious to see the NTSB report when it comes out. I mean, it's probably going to you know, take months. It could take a year. I mean, it takes him a long time to do that. And he was an interesting guy with a pretty interesting life that transcended basketball in many ways. In fact, the, the this will be by the time you hear this, it'll the, it'll be in the rear view. But um, it's Oscar weekend, and one of the kind of like interesting things about kind of Kobe Bryant as a larger figure than just an athlete uh or just his career as an athlete was he was an academy award winner for heaven's sake so uh so uh you know he had he definitely lived a a, a well-rounded life yeah i mean it was, he's just one of these guys that goes to show that your educational level has nothing to do with your intelligence so i've known a lot of lawyers and a lot of phds who are at fair to midland in terms of intellect you know there's a lot of people who don't have a lot of gifts who can grind through a lot, you know, and respect to them for it. Kobe was one of those guys who was very, very, very smart, not uh, uneducated, only a high school grad, but in terms of intellect, he was playing with a couple extra cards in the deck. You know, he spoke a bunch of languages, uh, you know, he's figured out, we're going to get to the story in just a second. We, he's figured out the venture capital world. Um, you know, he's, he did a lot with no degrees at all. Not to say you shouldn't get degrees, kids, but it just goes to show that you can't really judge someone by the, you know, the, the things after the comma, you know, after their name sometimes. Yeah. And there's many reasons for that, right? I mean, he had a, he, he comes from a, he came from a certain amount of wealth, not the wealth that he amassed, but, you know, father playing professional basketball in Europe. So they lived a, you know, he had a, you know, lived in many different places, had pretty varied experiences. Uh, you know, he sort of, he had those other things in life that, you know, that allows an intellect, allows experiences, allows someone to have a kind of a more um, experienced worldview, even by 17 or 18, than, than many people in general, and certainly many different than many, you know, people entering the NBA. Yeah, and he's playing, you know, on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he's playing at the top of the pyramid. You know, whereas someone else who came from poor economic circumstances is playing at the bottom of the pyramid. You can't learn to speak, um, you know, Italian when you're worried about your safety and where you're gonna, how you're gonna eat. You know, so certainly sent that's right, but um, that also has nothing to do with just pure brain power and intellect either. You know, he's just a smart guy, <laughs> just a very yeah. smart guy. And there's also oh. no substitute for. I mean, you can read about. Rome and your Western Civ One freshman seminar. It's another thing to go to Rome. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So I mean, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. It was very sad for all of us. His his um memorial service I just read yesterday is going to be on the second of February, at at Staples Center. You know, and the second of February is two forty four, which is his number and his daughter's basketball number. So there's significance to that date. So Staples Center will be a madhouse, would be my guess. Um, apparently, I guess they had Nipsey Hussle's um, memorial there and Michael Jackson's memorial there, and had to close the streets. So I would assume it's probably going to be the same problem again. If you know, Kobe might produce a bigger crowd than either one of those guys, frankly. So um, they, I heard they were considering doing it in the. Um, Doing it in the, at the L.A. Coliseum, which was you know eighty thousand seats, but ultimately decided against it. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. My wife was actually she's a music publicist, and she was actually at the Grammys, and she said it was definitely a surreal experience in in general because that was the same day. It was in the Staples Center. It was in L.A. She said it was definitely kind of a weird experience to sort of be in all of that, you know, kind of as it was happening. It, yeah. Did it did it bring down? Did it have an air of a strange air about the place because you would think the Grammys would normally be a party, right? It's a bunch of musicians, and so I mean, when you say strange, what did she mean by that? Well, yeah, so it wasn't as festive, 
well, uh, it was, you know, on the red carpet stuff, which is literally my wife's job to bring people down. So, oh, okay. you know, the questions, the journalists, it was, everyone was asking about it. So just it was like from a topic of conversation, from kind of a, you know, a, a pall on the crowd to then, you know, lots of like spoken tributes during the performances, et cetera, et cetera. It just was it was a, a it was just dominant in the anything that went on that day and in that yeah. in that ceremony. Well, so sad, but um, much like the world, we need to move on <laughs> to a sports business story because we could talk about Kobe all day, <laughs> but we shouldn't because this is a sports business show. All right, so we were going to look at, through the lens of Kobe and other athletes, one of the things that made him interesting as a post-playing career, which wasn't, you know, his, we're not that, we weren't that deep into his post-playing career, really, Um but, you know, he was a little bit of a different entrepreneur and, but maybe not a complete outlier, as it looks like other athletes are also looking at building venture capital portfolios and becoming venture capitalists with their excess funds. Um, and anyone who's paid multiple, 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 multiple millions to play a game has excess wealth um, and something to do to build more wealth. So, Steve, why don't you give maybe just a brief introduction like very brief about what venture capital is and then we can talk about what some of these players are doing okay so venture capital is financing that people get from non-traditional sources such as very wealthy people as opposed to your traditional lenders and they do that uh by trading uh you know like if you go get a loan from a bank you're going to pay back a loan you're going to pay interest you know of depends on what deal you get and and whatnot but venture capital you're going to let uh, you're going to give them a portion of the business. So you have a wealthy guy, you have Kobe Bryant, you come to him and say, I have a startup for an energy drink, which he did. This is like body armor. For those of you who don't know, body armor was was something in Kobe's portfolio. And body armor started by a bunch of guy, group of guys um, who formed a company who kind of came up with this drink and they went to Kobe Bryant and they said, we need venture capital. Kobe's got a lot of money. So he says, I will give you an X amount of money in exchange for this percentage of the business. The, the example of this that's better than any other is Shark Tank. If any of you have ever watched Shark Tank, um, Shark Tank are, is, it appears by all means to be more or less real as opposed to a reality TV setup. It looks like this is, these are legit deals that are being done. So Shark Tank um, has a bunch of startup people come and they, they go into the Shark Tank and they try to convince you, convince um, the sharks to give them a deal um, and what they're trading off almost exclusively is a percentage of the business so it's better for the um, for it's better for the for the owners of the business to have the expertise of someone like that and it's ultimately it's a better business decision than paying a bank you know incurring a whole bunch of debt and having to owe a bank you know a bank loan so that's what venture capital is um, and so the story here if you go back years and years and years, like decades, these athletes, none of these athletes were really wealthy enough to really fund <coughs> or finance a, a venture capital because they weren't making a lot of money back then. Um, but nowadays, these athletes, particularly basketball players, but basketball, football, and baseball, all three of them, um, have got just oodles and oodles and oodles of money. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, like Mookie Betts, who just signed with the Dodgers, is probably going to get. He might get four hundred million next year if this next season goes well. He's probably going to get a four a four hundred million dollar deal. So um, these athletes have got nothing but time and nothing but money, and so instead of the smart ones, instead of just burning through it on, you know, let's open a restaurant you know, and get swindled by a cook, they are getting into the Silicon Valley, um, you know, venture capital world. Um, the, the article that we found was from CNBC, believe it or not, um, dated February 2nd, updated February 3rd. So just this past week, titled Why Pro Athletes Like Richard Sherman and Andre Iguodala Are Closing Up to Venture Capital by uh, Kate Rooney. That's the story. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what, you know, the article obviously mentions... Um, uh, mentions Richard Sherman, who is a Stanford grad, who is very, very smart, and he's seen this as a way to uh, expand his wealth in a way that you can't just by putting money in a savings account, or you know, or putting money in a stock in the stock market. It's so risky; you never know what's going to happen. Um, so, you know, and and um, so there's a list here of 
the top venture capital deals with athletes' involvement. Impossible Foods is, is number one. They've got $300 million in venture capital from athletes. Impossible Foods is the uh, plant-based food company. I believe, Chris, isn't that right? You said you had the Burger King Impossible Whopper, right? Uh, I have, multiple times, actually. That is, Impossible Foods has a deal with Burger King to provide the Impossible Whopper to Burger King. Um, Rubric, Casper, Postmates, Blue Jeans, uh, Kaliva, I don't know what that is, Nerd Wallet, Mobile Media, Make Space, and Go Forward. All those are um, companies that have top uh, athlete involvement. Now, if you look at the list of athletes who have a ton of money in this, surprising names, Joe Montana, uh, Kevin Durant, Andre, Andre Iguodala, as I said, uh, Serena Williams, Steph Curry, Michael Jordan, Carmelo Anthony, Magic Johnson, uh, Lance Armstrong, Derek Jeter. They're not listing Kobe in here, I would assume, because he's no longer with us, obviously. Um, now, I don't know how they're measuring the amount, because the amounts don't add up to me. <clears throat> um, but... Uh, the the list the list here says Joe Montana has thirty two separate venture capital deals in his portfolio. It lists a value of three hundred fifty one million. <laughs> now, Joe Montana ha- didn't make thirty anywhere near three hundred fifty one million in his playing career. I'm assuming that what that's measuring is the value of the deals, not the money he's injected. It has to be because they've listed Kevin Durant as 487 million. He's only made about 170 million in his career. So I think what they're measuring there is the the value of the deals he's invested in, which is a lot of money. But it goes from there. So it's um it's not it's what's good about this is um venture capital when done right is a legitimate business you know, and a legitimate way to uh, help entrepreneurs. Another guy who's into this is the actor. Um, the the guy who's married... Oh, God. Help me, Chris. Um, the, the the guy who was in that 70s show, The Tall Kid. Oh, Ashton Kutcher. Ashton Kutcher is really into VC, too. Um, he's another one from Hollywood. But it, this is... What we're not talking about here is, you know... You know, John from the corner wants you to help him sell fake Gucci bags on the corner. This is this is a legitimate um, business model that has legitimate people uh, people running it, and it's a much smarter way for athletes to invest their invest their excess income than what has been done in years past. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, as you said, athletes investing even in legitimate businesses isn't a new phenomenon necessarily, but they generally they generally turn out to be unwise investments. So the restaurant is usually cited as the example because it's usually one that they do. And, you know, on restaurants are horrible return and they fail more often than they succeed. So uh, they're bad investment no matter how you slice it, just as a, if you're looking to for a return, right? If you're, you want to create a restaurant or whatever, I mean, there's a lot of risk, but at least you have a, there's a multitude of reasons why you're doing it. Just giving money to somebody to start a restaurant is usually a very bad investment. And they're usually subject to business managers who are really making these decisions and the bets are questionable. What's fine. I find interesting about this is one Venture capitalists take a portfolio approach. It's not just investing in one business and like sitting there with crossed fingers hoping it pays off, right? Like venture capitalists miss on tons of stuff, but the point is that they have a portfolio of stuff and that they're managing some are going to hit, some are going to have middling returns, some are going to fail, but you you know, you have you have a you have a bouquet of investments that that's going to perform at different levels and you have someone figured figuring that out. Also, that's a much more mature ecosystem in terms of the kind of professionals and the kind of people that you bring in. It's a firm. It's a venture capital firm, right? It's not just you giving money to somebody. There's usually much more sophisticated infrastructure and human resource around how to do that. And it's not shocking to me that we have this Cal- very California-centric athlete list. Um, you know, Richard Sherman went to Stanford which make, and graduated, which makes him not only just a smart guy, but they're also the, the grand church of venture capital university, Stanford, you know. Or, and he's from L.A. too, by the way. Yeah. He's, from, he's a California guy. Yeah, so Golden State players, again, they're in San Francisco. This is the epicenter of venture capital in the entire world. So uh, there's, it's really also interesting to see, you know, Kobe Bryant, obviously. There's the very California-centric people that we're talking about, which is, you know, it's a, a legitimate business model anywhere. But in California, it's even more maybe common is the thing. word. 
it's yeah. a new thing. And, and like Kobe had a firm. It was it was something like Bryant Sitkel or so. It was it starts with an S. And the other guy is is an experienced finance guy. You know, and so he's the one who's who's probably trying to drive the bus and teach. You know, was trying to teach Kobe what to do. And yeah, and Kobe Bryant had a portfolio of a whole bunch of things. You know, he was involved in U.S. in, in the UFC. You know, uh, Ultimate Fighting, Body Armor. You know, a whole bunch of other things. And he had his um, his uh, startup. Um, uh, you know, film company. You know, out there that was the one that produced Dear Basketball and won the won the Grammy. And so, yeah, I mean, the the point here isn't I guess I didn't explain that very well the point here isn't that these people are going to take all their money and dump it into one business that's not what this is they invest a little bit here a little bit there and you know they'll have a whole portfolio of things and yeah you're right some of them are going to fail some of them are not but taken as a whole you can think of it as kind of like a mutual fund it's sort of if you want to think of it as it's a mutual fund that you have direct involvement in is base is is I think a a pretty good analogy to this thing you know a mutual fund is going to have invested in stocks in hundreds of companies you know venture capitalist is going to have ownership in a whole bunch of different companies and as a whole there's going to be a lot of growth if you do it right in what I've heard Ashton Kutcher talk about this and he said if you do it enough you can kind of tell the ones that are you know up front you can have a pretty good sense of the ones that are going to make it and ones that are not because they have expertise they have organization you know and they have a lot of things um, right up front, whereas the 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 ones that are going to fail, the ones that aren't organized, you know, the you know they they have less expertise is what they're talking about, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's I applaud these guys for doing the right thing because, and I really wanted to bring this up not just because it was a Kobe Bryant story, but because we hear so many stories about these athletes who end up in the ditch, you know, after, uh, you know, life after football, basketball, baseball, et cetera. But we don't hear a lot about the ones that succeed. We hear a lot about Magic Johnson, uh, you know, because, um, you know, he's probably, I would assume, probably the most successful, financially wise, the most successful athlete, American athlete out there. But beyond that, we don't hear about a lot of the success stories. And so these are all people, that list of people I read who are, who have already succeeded, could retire today, uh, never miss it, and become incredibly wealthy. And they've done the right thing, and I applaud them for it. Yeah, it's super interesting to me too. For one, you know, right? We we hear the we hear the flame outs, and that's a that's a sort of narrative, right? Uh, narrative based on truth. It happens. There's a great thirty for thirty about this, actually, about uh, athletes going bankrupt. Uh, if you ever go and find that online or whatever. Um, but and then there's traditional ways to invest, which we've talked about. And then there's also just players that just know are smart enough to just sit on their money and live off you know which is totally fine right you make enough money for you and your next generation to live comfortably they just go do that and we don't hear about them again or very little um but what i find interesting about this is venture capital is more i can understand why it would speak to a high performing athlete's mindset one it's not like just having a varied portfolio of stocks which you're unless you're really at the top end of the stockholder which these guys aren't you have no involvement right you're just watching the ticker every day on cnbc or whatever like anybody else has got day trading or, or even a professional trader when you do venture capital you it's more active you you actually have a role you you have your advice is heard you know so there it's it's almost like if there's an aspect of performance and playing which obviously these athletes you know ha, are accustomed to there is still risk so uh, and their efforts can sometimes sway whether the company makes money or not through their advice through their involvement through their brand recognition so it's a little bit more of an active playing field as well in terms of your investments than lots of other ways that you might smartly invest your money for comfort yeah a- athletes have a history of of getting involved in entrepreneurial things and the reason is exactly like what chris said about their mindset they have an aggressive risk-based mindset because that's how they got to be top and top end athletes is risking their bodies you know having to perform in front of the world on on the biggest stage with nobody to help you there's a team but ultimately it's about you and so that sort of mindset translates well into this kind of business where you know the a lot of most of these guys aren't just going to go work for you know coke they're not going to go be a middle manager at Coca-Cola because that doesn't really suit their competitive edge. Whereas these sort of entrepreneurial startup, you know, ventures that venture capital gets involved in, 
definitely suits their mindset and and like chris said it allows them to have a role in it and play a role and and um i uh, feel like they're contributing to it and so it keeps them active so yeah i mean i that's i think it suits the athlete mindset to a t and of course you know you have to have money to do this everybody who's competitive can't do it because you know you have to live and you have to eat and so most the average you know the average american can't invest as much money as these guys do obviously for obvious reasons i mean a lot of us who work at coke and mental management do it because we need it and you have to have it whereas these guys don't you know kobe bryant could have you know lived the rest of his days doing absolutely nothing and lived like a king you know so it's a matter of income and if you look at the kind of people that are that are not athletes who but are generally make up a venture capital kind of archetype um you know these are these are often people who either come from a bunch of wealth and that's one way right just a way to continue to flip wealth but often you know they've had a lot of success sold a few companies you know and then they flip that wealth into this kind of venture capital so um and it's very very similar risk high risk high reward high involvement mindset for all involved in venture capital so i think it's a, i think it's super interesting I'm, I'm glad you found the story because um we'll see I, I mean it would be interesting i mean what would be super interesting is if someone actually created an you know this would probably be some smart agent but created actually like an athlete centric venture capital firm right like that actually like you know that that would be sort of a, the interesting next step because most of the joe montana i read an article about him you know in which his firm isn't even that old um but they they basically just go gather a team it's and and from there but i wonder if there was something that made this a little bit more like you know think of the what's the players what's that players player blog? players tribune yeah players what's tribune. the players tribune version of a venture capital firm yeah, Players Tribune was started by Derek Jeter and, and two or three other, you know, other folks, and they've sold. Now we're going to get into this story yeah. actually here in just a minute, <laughs> which is it's a good transition. But yeah, I mean, Players Tribune was kind of born out of the idea that the media won't let us tell our stories, and so let's give a forum in which we are not going to hold back, um, and you know, it's going to allow the athlete to get their story out in their words. And so yeah, I mean, is there a venture capital, you know? Um, you know, version of this, it doesn't sound like it, but, you know, give it a few years and there probably will be, would be my guess. I mean, what's you know, the idea that, to just to make names up, you know, Richard Sherman could team up with Andre Iguodala and a bunch of others who all have a lot of money and bring in some business guy who knows more than they do, you know, as a partner. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. That probably will happen. <laughs> um, and the other thing, whether this is becoming a, you know, highly successful venture capitalist or... Uh, media personality or you just live a quiet life or you flame out one thing we have to keep remember keep in mind about all of this is these guys professional career of the thing that they're best at is done by what was kobe 37 when he retired yeah oh uh, when he retired yeah he was 38 i believe so i mean which is even right that's on the long end of an athlete's career nba players go a little longer but so you're, you're essentially talking about people who are done doing their best thing at 33, 34, 28, 40. So that's a lot of lifetime to live on the other side. So it that's why it makes whatever they do, it's what makes this sort of interesting always just because like what do you do when the thing you're best at is done at 32? And your mindset doesn't change. You know, they're still ultra competitive people. That doesn't go away, and that's why a lot of them have problems. Is they just don't, they can't find anything that satisfies the itch. And let's be honest, I mean, a lot of them like the spotlight, you know, as well, and the celebrity part of it. And all that's just gone. You know, you retire, and then the next day, nobody cares about you whatsoever. Um, for for the vast majority of these people, and I think it's probably a very very difficult transition. And some of them just haven't planned appropriately. Kobe planned for this. Kobe had been thinking about this for years. You know, and he had a whole, he had several businesses set up by the time uh, he retired. And there's a funny story, and I know we have to move on, but the, the funny story is that apparently on the last day of his NBA career, you know, the game that he scored 60 points in, you know, the famous last game, he almost missed the game because he was in his film studio offices and looked up when, oh my God, I got to get to Staples Center. You know, the game's, you know, the game's going to start and, you know, whatever his report time is, is coming up. <laughs> You know, so because he was thinking he had already kind of moved on, 
it, you know, it's all makes it all the more amazing. He's, you know, scored 60 points, but, um, you know, he had planned for it. Whereas the people that flame out traditionally are the ones that have no plan whatsoever. Yeah. Even if it's just the right mutual fund to park their money in for the next 40 years. Yeah, exactly right. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll we'll go on to a story that might signify that that current NBA players may have slightly less money to uh, <laughs> invest in uh, a revolution in in uh, mops or something. Um, I wonder when we'll see an NBA player on Shark Tank. That I, I bet you it happens, but that's an aside. They, there's already been NBA players on Shark Tank. I mean, as a shark or as with an idea. Charles Barkley was a shark. Oh, that's right. Charles Barkley, of course, is yeah. a shark. And yeah. Don't and Shaq is going to be on there one of these days. Shaq is already doing VC, so yeah. he's going to be he's going to be a shark one of these days, I guess. Uh, yeah, and Shark Tank's totally legitimate. I mean, you can't walk through Target without seeing as seen on Shark Tank about fifteen yeah. times. Yeah, um, exactly. So, NBA players may have slightly less money to get into this or other kinds of deals um, because it looks like some of the NBA's revenue problems are going to may mean that there is a drop in the salary and luxury caps and taxes and all that good stuff heading into next season, which is maybe our most concrete sign that the NBA does have a little bit of revenue issues, which we've talked about in terms of ratings uh earlier in shows we've talked about in terms of the uh and the nba thinking of different things to do with their schedule and the wacky tournament mid-season tournament ideas and stuff um so just coming out of their all-star you know no, the all-star games coming up um so you know which is a big moment in time for them we've it's sort well, of almost the trade their super bowl just, the trade yeah. deadline just happened yeah <clears throat> so wow you know, we could have said we could have been talking at the margins in some of our earlier topics, but this is a pretty big sign that there's they're not making as much money as they'd like. Yeah, I can't remember in either the NFL or the NBA the salary cap ever going down for either one of those sports ever. You know, that's never happened before, to my knowledge. And I think the biggest reason for this is probably China. You know, because recall if we go back a few months, um, this started when the Rockets general manager whose name is escaping right now daryl morey <laughs> sent out a tweet that said something to the effect of you know free hong kong um uh, you know and in the history of hong kong is it was under british rule and it was a democracy in the middle of china and the chinese the communist chinese government always hated that um and even when great britain turned hong kong over to china you what 20 years ago at this point <laughs> 25 years ago maybe um it still has vestiges of democracy that the Chinese, you know, Bernie Sanders socialists out there want, are trying to crush. And so by Daryl Morey saying free Hong Kong, that really irritated the big wigs in China, which then put the kibosh on the NBA in China in large part while the uh, Lakers and I think the Brooklyn Nets were over in China. <laughs> And this caused a huge problem. It caused the NBA to look ridiculous because it looked, made, made the NBA look like they were kowtowing to the Chinese government, which they were. And so the effect of that is I think the NBA lost like $150 million in revenue um, as a result of that China thing. And so my get, yes, the ratings have been down. And we've talked about that. We talked, you know, about in previous shows. But I think this revenue dip and the dip in the salary cap, I think, is due to China more than any other reason. So it might be. I don't think we're going to see this again next year, at least to this extent, because China won't. It, it is what it is at this point. They're not going to lose another 150 million in China. Um, it, you know, I. You know, China kind of is what it is at this point. So my guess is that we'll see at least an even cap next year. Thoughts. Uh, I think that's probably right. Um, although sometimes these things have a tendency to combine and steamroll, so they're gonna, ha you know, we'll see. You know, the, oh yeah, it actually is. Enough. It definitely is a steamroll thing, but I think the biggest component probably is China. Yeah, um, and they'll probably be the NBA has been a smart league, so they'll overall, so they'll probably have some contingencies and some ways to deal with it. And I don't, I, we are certainly not here calling gloom and doom on the NBA's long-term health. But it has been an interesting year, and this really is a piece of evidence about how some of these things do kind of come home to, to roost. And also, you know, we've had such a, 
you know, this sort of player run league impression, whether how much of that is reality or not, you know, is up for debate. Um, but what I find interesting about this, and even the players tripped over themselves around China. So they, they were not immune to that kind of like, you know, the, this, everyone just sort of tripped over themselves uh, because it's one of those things where no one wants that apple cart upset, right? Because everyone just wants it to roll along and sweep everything under the rug. So after Moray's comments, none of that was possible. So everyone was tripping over the apples as they spilled out of the cart. Um, but it does show that, you know, it does kind of reiterate the relationship between the players and the league they play for. And I do think probably at some point the NBA and the players are going to have to think about some different or business models, you know, whether it's the next CBA, something that shows this connection. And what's interesting is a couple of players have linked their salaries to the per- percentage of the salary cap, which, you know, not only does it mean there's less money uh, for players overall, because luxury tax is down, salary cap is down, but there's players like uh, Ben Simmons, Jamal Murray, Pascal Seacom that literally have their salary fluctuate depending on the percentage, uh, based on a percentage of the cap. So there's actually players whose salaries explicitly change when the cap changes. I mean, that's sort of tying, that, that's sort of making the in, these NBA players more of a quote partner than in, in other leagues. And let's make no mistake, there's no partnership in reality. You know, the only the they don't own stock in the company in the NBA uh, teams. The the NBA owners do, and that's not the player. So it's not a real partnership. But what the NBA has done, and I think sometimes it's for better or for worse, is give the impression to the public and to the players that it is truly more of a partnership. Because the the NFL, um, you know, the union and, and management is constant. They're constantly at odds. You know, about all sorts of things. They're negotiating now. You know, which is good, but um, they've been at war in the past. The NBA never has because the league office and NBA ownership has made a concrete effort to make players feel as though they're more of a part of the process. Um, as you said, you know, now that you have some contracts tied to ownership, it's basically akin to owning a percentage of the business, like a non-voting in- interest in the business. It's basically, in essence, what it's akin to, even if, technically speaking, he doesn't own stock in the 76ers so it's um i think this is more of a blip in the radar scope more than anything in terms of that big of a loss because no matter how unless the ratings truly go in the tank and then you're going to start risking the tnt contract and the espn contract um unless that really happens that's almost a foolproof way to, to at least stay you know above water and it was really, I think, the China thing, which is what really made it dip. Um, if the ratings truly went in the tank, then you fast forward a few years and start to question what the follow-on TV contract is going to be like. But I just don't see that happening, really, because they've stayed in the pop. They stayed in the um, in the pop culture world pretty well. You know, everybody talks about the NBA twelve months a year, maybe eleven months a year for the most part. So I mean, they're they're always going to be there. They're always going to make money. Um, I don't think we're going to see this kind of dip again. Just my guess. No matter how bad the ratings get, unless it truly went in the tank completely, and I just almost find that impossible. Yeah, no, I would, I would concur. It'll be interesting around this time next year. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to track over the next couple of years um, which way it goes. And even the China issue, like a year from now or a year from when the controversy hit, you know, the NBA is good business for China too. So, like, once once the dust settles and we've got a year behind it, like, I would imagine those relationships, that revenue, returns to normal a year, two years out anyway. As long as I keep the Daryl Morris of the world quiet. You know, this just goes to show, by the way, um, if people in the public eye start preaching politics, and I don't mean, I don't mean one side or the other because, you know, it happens on both sides – um, there's a risk to doing that. So if you get too mouthy about politics, about um, you know social issues and all this stuff, there's a risk that comes with it. And the risk is you're going to alienate a whole bunch of people on the other side of the position you took. In this case, it happened with China. You know, you have a senior executive say free Hong Kong. Well, that irritated a whole bunch of communist Chinese folks. You know, if you, you take positions on other things, it's going to irritate the other side. Um, if you're trying to stay in the public eye and you have a gravy train like the NBA, my advice to all of everybody would be stay in your lane, 
Don't mouth off about politics and social issues at all. Just play basketball and let it happen. You know, just let it happen. Uh, that would be my advice because I think that's the best way to keep to keep things on track. Well, anything you time, anytime your business model is based on a mass consumption, then you know lots of things uh, go into affecting that, and and that's why people are extremely careful on all fronts around on around what yeah is going to that, cut into that mass appeal. Unless your name is Daryl Morey. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and also there's a, probably a difference between like uh, a player popping. Off. It would have still been an issue, but a, there's there is a difference between a player popping off on on this issue, China, uh, and a NBA executive, which is what he is. So uh, the, the, it also is about levels of risk of where you are on that sort of food chain. And so you know, if uh, I don't know, I'm not if uh, random NBA player says you know free hong kong it would have been a story there probably would have been some annoyance but someone who runs basically a biz runs helps run a business partner in that deal says it that's a whole different level yeah well and the other thing about the free china thing in particular or free hong kong is that i think the bulk of americans would agree you know at, at some level they'd go oh, yeah that makes sense you know free hong kong so it's not controversial in the united states it's only controversial in china you know, I'm not going to give a percentage, but the vast majority of the people in the United States would go, sure, yes, or at a very, very minimum, not see it as an overly controversial statement. Whereas you get into some uh, issues that divide the American public, it becomes a much bigger thing for us here um, and has a much bigger chance of of dividing the American audience. Whereas we, re we really didn't see that in the Daryl Morey China incident because we all kind of agreed with him. At some level, we all kind of agreed with them. So you take a more controversial stance that applies to Americans, you're risking, look what happened with the NFL. I mean, the NFL had that problem a couple of years ago, you know, with this. And it took a couple of years to get to get through it. So uh, this just, it's it's truly an example of uh, stay in your lane and don't upset the apple cart. Or be okay with the uh in, yeah, with or be up with the result, right? Or know that yeah, you know, you're risking, uh, you're putting something at risk, and you can make that choice, and you know that's fine, <laughs> certainly. Um, super interesting. We have uh, their All Star Extravaganza weekend coming up, and of course their their postseason. Um, and we'll see where the relationship with China goes. Like I said, it's too. It, it's also very important to China too. They're not, you know. They're not as much the kingmakers as we may make them out to be. They they need the NBA as well. So I think I think there will be a, a return to norm here over the, over a stretch of time. In fact, there probably already is at an operational level. Probably so. Somebody needs to take this money out of Daryl Morey's paycheck. <laughs> he, it's kind of. I mean, I'm I'm a little bit surprised he still got his job. I'm, yeah, I'm surprised somebody didn't fire him. Yeah, I mean, it, that's up to – he works for the owner of the Houston Rockets, who's Tillman Fertitta, and Tillman might have just said, eh, pff, no, you know. Right, weather the storm. But right. ultimately, he's not that important. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. Well, but Daryl, but job. Maury, if you know about what Daryl has done – I'm not a Rockets fan, but I do live in Houston. <laughs> um, but what Daryl has done for the Rockets is – it's taken him a decade to do it, but he's he was kind of leading the charge with um, sort of a sabermetrics type approach to basketball, and it's taken a long time to get there, and he hasn't got there yet. He hadn't won a title, but Daryl is actually very important to the way the Rockets operate and always has been, so I think that's probably part of it is I don't think you can replace Daryl Morey with the Houston Rockets and get a guy like him and still keep them on the path they're on. So I think that's probably part of the part of the issue with the Rockets. They're going to make the playoffs this year, right? Oh yeah, they'll make the playoffs. Yeah. Um <laughs> he's kind of the money ball, he's kind of the money ball guy of the Yeah, NBA, advanced stats type of stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nerd so. sports. Um I'm not fully. I, I I fight somewhere in the middle between that. I'm not anti, not pro. Um, I think there's a balance to it. Um, I think the saber metrics go in baseball goes way too far. I think people put uh, way too high a significance on the WAR stat. 
which is wins over replacement. If you look at the way it's calculated, it's very, it's a very, very imprecise stat. Uh, different sites, different um, outlets calculate war differently, and yet, you know, the saber nerds of the world just think that's the be all, end all of of statistics, and I think it goes way too far. Just for an example, so I think there's you can't substitute a person who knows how to look at a pitcher and go, wow, that guy can pitch. Um, you know, I'll take that guy over you know, wins over replacement every time, personally. <laughs> but that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah, that is. Um, all right, so our last story actually hits a little bit close to home here. Um, and we sort of always check in on the digital media landscape, especially when it comes to um, the sports and, and sports media. And, you know, when we say digital media or digital publishing, which we may say a few times here, we really mean anything on the web. Websites, blogs, podcast content, video content. It's just basically these entities that publish content on the web. And you could make an argument with the sort of like fast death of paper that digital publishing is just publishing. So we're basically just talking about, you know, sports media with digital as its main pipe at this point. But there's a lot of interesting things. So this this firm minute media just purchased something called uh fan sided which they add to their holdings of other digital media sports publishing properties and lifestyle um with a real focus on regional so that means like covering regional sports you know uh speaking to regional fandoms um even in the sort of lifestyle brands to regional focus and you know Not super exciting necessarily on its face, but we've seen a lot of movement in this space. You know, Deadspin basically collapsed earlier this year um, on the sort of negative side. Uh, Sports Illustrated was never able to really make the jump. We saw them kind of crumble on the positive side. the, The Ringer just sold to Spotify for a ton of money. So we see a lot of movement. But what's interesting about this story is it's fairly small in terms of how it's covered, but super impactful. And this Minute Media uh, really is doing something smart in that regional-focused properties give them large coverage. And now they've got a portfolio, back to this idea, of investments in these spaces that accounts for 90 million viewers 90 minute night so 90 million audience members essentially um in their growing portfolio and they seem to be pretty smart in identifying a niche for themselves and going after it pretty aggressively and probably outgunning some of the big ones because these regional sized audiences that have think about it they have dedicated fan bases they kind of they're not as fluid because people are into their area, they're into their sports teams, they're into their local. Uh, people move more, so people are willing to pay out of market subscriptions and other things to get their local sports news. So what Minute Media has basically done as a business plan is says, you know, we're going to quietly gobble up these entities and then become a player uh both at mass audience size and regional power yeah, i mean just for example the hog sty we are a part of this at a much lower level you know we are the big heads media washington redskins representative we are the regional content for big heads media nobody's trying to compare big heads media to fan sided you know we're not but i mean this is we you know big heads media is a step into this of which we are a part um ESPN started this several years ago. ESPN had the foresight. One of the smart things, ESPN hadn't done a lot of smart things recently, but one of the smart things they did do is they are the ones that started this regional coverage from a national sports outlet. You know, if you go back 20 years, um, the media wasn't organized like this. You had your local coverage by your local media outlets. You know, uh, the Chicago the Chicago Tribune was the local coverage, you know, for, uh, you know, the um, the White Sox and the Cubs, for example, just off the top of my head. It, what ESPN figured out about, what, a decade ago now at least, is we can hire local reporters, bring them under the ESPN umbrella, and have an ESPN presence in every city that was never there before. And so ESPN is kind of the, the genesis of this. And so then you have Fansided, which is doing the same thing. Um, SB, the entire 
purpose uh, 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 business model of SB Nation is exactly that regional coverage under the SB Nation umbrella. Big Heads Media, you know our you know our uh, you know partner. Same thing, you know they they have a show for you know every local sports team. And so what Minute Media has figured out is we can be a viable alternative financially to the ESPN, um, which has become, which ESPN has gone from sort of a, a, um, a maverick startup thing in its early days, which is thumbing, literally thumbing its nose at traditional media, you know, live every night on sports center to becoming the traditional media. And so what minute media has done is, They've bought up a whole bunch of the alternatives. Didn't they buy up the Players' Tribune? <laughs> Isn't the Players' Tribune under their portfolio? Yeah. They've actually bought four with, – with Fansided. This is the fourth purchase in 18 months. So they're being aggressive in their, in their purchasing. But the Players' Tribune, the big lead, and Mental Floss, which the first two are sports. This, this third one's I've never heard of. Lifestyle. I've never heard of Mental Floss. <laughs> um, um, but they, they are turning into a viable – they're they're buying up all the competition, you know, and it's um it's obviously the future, you know, of sports. I don't think you're going to see another traditional. You're not going to see the rise of a competitor a competitor to ESPN, for example, that um, doesn't do regional coverage anymore. I don't think. I mean, Fox Sports is probably the biggest competitor, but they're not really a competitor to ESPN, probably numbers wise. <laughs> Um, but that's what these guys are doing. I mean, they're the maverick um, alternative to the traditional sports giants, and they see the regional coverage as being key. Because I'm probably a bad example because I lived all over the world, and you know, I don't live in the cities where any of my teams are. You know, any of that for that reason. But um, the majority of people are from their hometown. They live in their hometown area at least and they care about their hometown teams and while they want to watch sports center what they care more about is their hometown teams you know and so what the ringer has done is they bought up a bunch of properties that allow people to care about their hometown teams well minute media minute, sorry yeah minute media has done that yes that's why espn did what they did that's why espn hired a bunch of local reporters um so you know they can have more uh, local centric coverage and so that's it's the rec- this is the recognition that local centric coverage is probably the wave of the future in uh, sports media um speaking about espn if if you really want an example of their regional approach just try you know, I've had to travel internationally for work on and off. And, you know, you log on to ESPN in another country and depending on where you are, you're getting served soccer, cricket. I mean, you really see their, their regional focus there because they basically just route you to the country extension of that ESPN uh, URL. And suddenly you're in what, you know, you, you're just looking at nothing. You're going to get so FC one thing you go to instead of, you know, the yeah. Giants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's one thing to be in San Francisco and get, you know, your your 49er stuff streamed to you on ESPN, and you know, but you're basically looking at the same sports. It's nothing to be in another country and like, wow, they you know, you just try to find NFL scores. It's not easy. Yeah. Um and that's what fan and fan, the, the whole per, the whole approach of fan side is exactly that. Fan side doesn't even really do a ton of national media approach of things. They're all local centric. You know, and so you know, what Minute Media has done is bought up multiple of these properties and then throw in uh, the Players' Tribune into there too, uh, you know, which is different. And it's them. it's super fascinating. I'm sure they'll, I'm sure we'll see them buy a few more things. Um, what's super interesting too is that this is this is back to our kind of our venture conversation, much like a company who maybe is doing something interesting with search or digital video. When they launch their company and a promise often to their venture capitalist investors is that they will eventually get bought and everyone will have a big payday, right? That And that's actually probably, in my opinion, a critique of venture capital is that if the goal is to always sell and get bought, then you're not really building long-term companies. There's a short, there's an addiction to short-term return, whatever. We don't need to go deep into that, but make no mistake, these Re, this is also at play in these kind of things. I would guess, and you know, even the big head medias of the world, 
being purchased is a goal of those kinds of ventures. Like, the, you know, so looking good for Minute Media, being something that, that Minute, you know, to get purchased by Minute Media, you know, even The Ringer is a great example. The Ringer was doing fine. I'm sure it was doing well. But, like, there's always that goal of selling and moving on for a lot of these type of folks. So you'll see a lot of people in the space that, you know, are still independent or still, you know, trying to get this kind of niche. Their goal isn't necessarily to become an EX ESPN, even regionally. Their goal isn't to replace necessarily your local news outlets. And their goal really isn't even just to become a longstanding company. Often their goal is to get purchased by someone bigger and take a big pay. Yeah, and speaking of that, if any... You know, company out there wants a quality Washington DC Washington DC centric Redskins, you know, Redskins website, uh, you know, and and thinks we can provide, you know, coverage that will make you money. Contact me, the hogsty at gmail.com. You know, we'll listen to your offers. Only, you know, it's got to be 10 million or up, otherwise, you know, we're probably not going to do it. Yeah, uh someone quick tweet at minute media. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, but it's super fascinating. Another, you know, the the media landscape is on all fronts is changing at, at almost weekly pace. And so, one of the things that happens when there's that kind of huge flux and the falling of traditional giants, et cetera, et cetera, is you start to see what what the edge is doing, what is coming next. And so, this is a interesting an example of you know the people who are going to be able to seize on these opportunities that this level of change necessitates and so the minute medias of the world you know are they you know it could it could fail but you know they're they're taking a you know it's almost like you know it's like buying a bunch of stocks when the yeah. market's down yeah i mean in, in in the players tribune is a perfect example the players tribune was started with hypothetically an honest purpose in mind you know p- provide players like i said with an unvarnished um you know uncensored outlet to you know say what they want to say well you know what's happened is they've already sold <laughs> You know, uh, they've already cashed out. And so now the Players Tribune has a media overlord that could hypothetically dictate, you know, the type of content that they want the Players Tribune to to put out. And I'm not saying they have done it. I'm saying it's possible. And so um, I think in that case, the original intent was perverted, um, you know, by the lure of a large payday. You know, and that's what, like Chris said, that's what a lot of, you know, that's the goal for a lot of these things. Like a lot of the Shark Tank products, their whole goal is to sell out to, you know, a big, you know, media, a big media entity, a big company um, eventually and cash out and start another one. You know, that's what venture capitalism is in some respects. Yeah, right. They're not as interested, right? That's a difference between they're not interested in building the, the next Ford, right? The next GE, uh, they want, you know, the, the goal often with those is to get paid out much quicker. And that usually involves, if you're, you know, level of success, a, a giant a payout from a one-time sale. It's not about long-term building company, build, company building necessarily. We've tied the beginning of the show into the end. I know. That was actually it pretty was. good. <laughs> <I have to say. laughs> that was. Congrats, Chris. That's good. <laughs> All right. Well, we're not going to do better. <laughs> Might um, need to call it right? here. So yeah. let's, let's move to close. Uh, what do you got coming up on the, you know, well, here's your chance to really pitch the Hogstein Network in its holistic value. Yeah, for Minute Media out there who's listening and, you know, ready with a checkbook in hand, uh, we are going to provide all sorts of great content. We've, we've transitioned in fully into our off-season, uh, mode here for the Hogstein, so we're going to be covering the draft and free agency, um, you know, coming up, um, you know, as much content as you want. We're going to have a bunch of great guests on. Um, you know, so bias minute media, you know, we're here. Um, Rick Snyder, we have his, um, season of Dis- seasons of discontent show, which is his look at all things Washington, Washington DC sports and life. And I think it's also being linked on sports illustrated now, by the way, uh, seasons of discontent. Oh, cool. Yeah. So there's that. And, and we've got all sorts of great written content as well. So keep up with us every day. Click through, click, click, click. There you go. Get those clicks. Um, Silence. Yeah, no, you have to, you'll edit that out. Uh, I probably so, won't. Yeah, and it's you better can to obviously... have awkward silence. <laughs> I had a good comment, but it just it, it, it walked away right when I was time to say it. Um, anyway, so 
You can find us at the Hogsty. I'm oh, sorry, at uh, it's just business. You can find me at Chris Larry three three. You can find Steve and a cast of characters at uh, the the Hogsty on Twitter. Oh, I know, I was gonna say one kind of fun thing for the Hogsty Network in general is it won't be as bleak as an off season, right? So you, you d- it'll be at least interesting, a little optimism, and so it should be a little bit uh, a little bit more positive. Tenor, yeah, it's not imagine. just all these things that we, you would normally discuss are going to have a, a little bit of positivity. It's not just them. the march to death, you know, like we all yeah. know is coming most every year. Yeah, we've got Riverboat Ron and company, so it's at least something new and fun and different and a tiny bit of optimism. Good times. Right. I can tell you were trying and trying and trying to come up with your comment there. You were like stalling and, you know, I know what it is. I know, I had it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, with that, we will see you in two weeks.